The Gospel text for this Sunday is taken from Luke chapter 24, verses 44 through 53. Jesus told them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He also said to them, this is what is written. The Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead the third day and repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And look, I am sending you what my Father promised. As for you, stay in the city until you are empowered from on high. Then he led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, which is a little less than two miles from Jerusalem. And lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was carried up into heaven. After worshiping him, they returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they were continually in the temple praising God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated as we go into the text today. Lord, thank you for your word that um, you have given us, your very word which brought out of nothing all that we see your word that speaks and goodness and glory and beauty are made real. Your word that speaks and truth, the truth that sets us free, allows us to see. Your word that speaks and cleanses us from the d darkness and deceit, pain, of this world and your word that carries with it your life. So may we hear your word today with open arms, open ears, open minds, open hearts as your life continues to grow within us for your purposes and for your glory. And pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a lot to these verses today. One of the things that Jesus repeatedly talks about, however, that I like to focus our attention on is his name, as well as the name of his father. Although throughout all of the New Testament, he never mentions God as God revealed his name to Moses. He just refers to the name in the name of my Father. This is the last few verses that we read about in Luke. And he talks about his name. This is what's going to be proclaimed in my name. In the end of Matthew, he talks about all authority has been given in heaven and earth to me. Therefore, go and baptize in the name and I like to focus on what that means because it's really profound. When I was a little kid, we had a, a, a prayer that we did for each meal. Same prayer. Come, Lord Jesus. Anyone know this one? Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest. Let this meal or sometimes food gifts to us be blessed. And we would end it. Amen. And we went to visit some of our relatives at one time I was a young kid and they said the same prayer too must be a Minnesota thing they did it differently come Lord Jesus be our guest let this meal to us be blessed in Jesus name amen and when I came home I said you know we should probably do that I don't know why I wasn't a theologian I was a I was busy playing with G.I. Joe's but there was something about finishing the prayer with his name that there was just something to it that it added maybe more weight to the prayer. And so when we pray repeatedly, we end it 
in Jesus' name. It's not a formula. There's something to it that is profoundly, not just sacred, but supernatural, if you will. It's, it's spirit-bearing, like a bearing wall that holds it. And today, when Jesus is giving his final instructions before he's taken into heaven, he refers to this. This is what's going to be preached. Repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name. Realizing that the entirety of his ministry, the entirety of Scripture, refers to one profound truth that God has say over everything. And whatever God has say over is his kingdom. That's what a kingdom is. You have your own kingdom. If I was to go and pick up Garth's coat and start rummaging through his pockets, he would probably be offended or at least curious because his coat is his kingdom. He has say over it. And if I go into his coat and I start rummaging without asking him, what I am doing to his kingdom is trespassing. Hear that? Forgive us our trespasses. It's the same thing with your, with your car or your home. Whatever you have say over is your kingdom. And so if somebody keys your car, they have trespassed against you or breaks into your home, or takes your life. And so, the enemy that was in existence before the world was created, rebels against that kingdom. Does not want God to have say over what God rightly has say over. That's called rebellion. And the result of that is death. Fear of death is dread. And so we live in a world that has been contaminated by this rebellion. Contaminated with regards to our thoughts, primarily. But then our thoughts also affect and infiltrate our emotions, our feelings, which is a physical sensation. And Jesus proclaimed came proclaiming a very profound truth. The kingdom of God is available to anyone. It's right here. You don't have to go and search for it way over there. You don't have to search for it <clears throat> in faraway places. Through him, it's available to anyone who so desires to be in God's kingdom. But in order to live in that kingdom, it requires repentance. It's not that God wants people to be out of the kingdom and withholds them. It's simply that without repentance, you are, anyone is unable to live in it and to enter it in the same way that I cannot do physics until I learn addition. Like if Jesus were to say to you, truly, truly, I'd say to you, you cannot enter the world of physics until you learn addition. He's not trying to keep people out. It's just a fact. You can't enter it. And so repentance is the key component, if you will, the pillar that goes side by side with the proclamation of the kingdom. But it's kind of, well, foreign. Because we don't live in a world that pursues repentance. 
And so when Jesus starts his ministry, he starts it very clearly. The kingdom of God is at here. Repent, metanoeo in the Greek. <coughs> and ultimately what it means is to change or to think about what you think or how you think. And this is key because this is really ultimately what discipleship is about. Becoming the kind of people that think or that behave, if you will, bear fruit in the same way that God's nature bears fruit. <clears throat> and as such, God, and there's much to say about repentance, there's a lot to say. What I'm going to focus on today is his name, what he has say over because in repentance, what he begins to have say over, what he begins, is how you think. The Apostle Paul, before he was the Apostle Paul, was the astute, professional, exemplary, religious leader of Israel. He knew, in his mind, how to do what the Lord had commanded. His thinking was completely formed by his Jewish training, which was very good, but incomplete. And this is, this is so important to understand. His Jewish training was very good. In fact, without his Jewish training, we would not have his letter to the Roman church we would not have any of his letters. God specifically gave him his training so that once Christ was revealed in his life, he would be able to resort to that training to express the fullness of what that training was leading him towards in Christ. And while he knew it, it was incomplete. And as such, what Paul became before Christ was a very zealous religious legalist. Which is a great temptation. I'm right. You may be right. But you're incomplete. And so, as we are listening to what Jesus is saying with regards to his name is, you're right. When God has say over your life, he has say over what you think. And while what you think may be right, it may not be complete. I'll give you an example. I can get a PhD in Greek and in Hebrew and memorize my Bible right and left and upside down and backwards forward. And I may be right when I quote scripture. But knowledge puffs up. Oh, you're not hearing me. It comes from my Assemblies of God background. Love builds up. Because I may be right, that doesn't mean that the Spirit is telling me to open my mouth and say something. And so when God has say over our thoughts, he not only has say over what we think, that's the beginning stage, but when to say what we think, how to say what we think, and sometimes when to keep Steve Krogh's big mouth shut. Because it would do more harm than good, even though I may be right. This, in part, is what Jesus means when he says, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. I've commanded you to love one another. Love does not puff up, it builds up. 
And this process, when he says he, of having say over all of our lives, is indeed just that. It is a process that nobody ever graduates from because you don't get a degree in it and you don't ever stop being involved in that process right up until the very day that you see Jesus. It is his, that's why Paul can say we are his workmanship. God's not done with us. God is constantly involved through his spirit. And this is important to understand because this repentance thing is impossible to do without his spirit. It's impossible. You cannot do it. Now, you can get a degree. And you can get um, a lot of knowledge. And you can get ordained. And you can get all these different credentials without the Holy Spirit. But one cannot experience or partake or participate in or practice repentance without the Spirit of God. That's impossible. And this is why Jesus is so adamant 40 days after his, his um, teaching, or after his resurrection rather, 40 days after his resurrection, he taught and he taught and he taught. That's a long time, 40 days. And the only things that we have recorded are what we have recorded, because this, this is the key thing. And I'm guessing that most of what he taught refers to what we just read about that repentance. Because without the Holy Spirit, following Jesus can fall into a religious legalism that wreaks havoc and pain and suffering and brokenness in his name. I've been guilty of it. I've said things that have been cruel and mean. I mean, not in the last decade, but. <laughs> yeah, me neither. Yeah, you neither. <laughs> Dave and R. Dave and I, we, we got it going on, but. Right? And see, this is the thing about repentance, is that the Spirit will lead us beyond, because while I may know all these things, it's incomplete. I still have to walk with him that's the completeness and lo I am with you always even to the end of the age learning that truth <clears throat> and having that truth transform my mind and my very body because it is a full experience um, I was uh, th this last week earlier this, this week it was in the morning sometimes I was having a cup of coffee and I said to Kyle I said you know when, when nations are at war and they're, they're bombing each other or one nation is bombing another nation, sometimes they'll pick out a bridge or maybe a factory or maybe an army or a military installation. But other times, if they have enough bombs, they'll just drop them all over the entire area. And we call that carpet bombing. I said, that's what I feel the enemy has been doing this week and is doing right now. I don't think it. I feel it. That feeling that you're feeling, if you're you know, feeling what I'm feeling, etc., and it's a feeling, is called dread. Familiar? Just dread is not of faith. It means there's part of me physically that's simply not trusting in God. Want to desire to pursue it but I'm not there yet so what takes place is with the Holy Spirit discernment because if I speak from my dread I will speak death into every single conversation I have did you hear what happened death and it spreads like a virus one person that can be celebrating God one moment can be totally wrapped up in dread the next. 
And this is so key. Peter understands this more than anybody after the resurrection because he was so confident, so confident after three years of being with Jesus, no matter what happens, I won't leave you. I've, 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 I've learned so much from you. I've walked on water and yeah, you had to rescue me. In the front, in, in, in front of my friends, you told me to get behind you, Satan. I mean, uh, but I've learned no matter what happens, God, no matter what happens, I will not leave you. That sense of confidence. And then fear just <sighs> overtook him. When the little girl asked him if he was a follower of Jesus, do you think he even thought about his reaction? No, just came out of him. I don't know the man. That's what fear will do. Fear will drive us to say things in a reactionary manner outside of his reign, outside of God's.